Well, good evening. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Moniz Farupi. I am the director of the Institute of South Asia Studies and also a member uh, of the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. It really gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome Professor Jisha Menon to work with me, um, as well as being the director for the Center of South, for South Asia at Stanford, a position she has incidentally held uh, since 2017. Professor Menon is also an associate professor in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies, where she teaches courses that focus on post-colonial theory and performance studies. Speaking to Professor Menon's wide-ranging intellectual interests, her published work has engaged everything from India's partition and political violence in South Asia to diasporic feminist theater, transnational queer theory, and neoliberal urbanism. Some of these themes were picked up in her 2013 book, Performance of Nationalism, India, Pakistan, and the Memory of Partition, which was published by Cambridge University Press. In this book, she considered the affective and performative dimensions of nation making to think through the political history and crisis of its aesthetic representation in South Asia. Other themes will be engaged in her forthcoming next book, which we're all looking forward to seeing at some point, um, tentatively titled at this point, Pedestrian Acts, Performing the City in Neoliberal India, which considers new narrations of selfhood that are produced at the intersection of neoliberal state global market, and consumer fantasies. Professor Menon is also the co-editor of two volumes. The first is a 2009 volume with Patrick Anderson, titled Violence Performed, Local Roots, and Global Roots of Conflict. And the other is a 2017 volume with uh, Melia uh, Glubovic, of the title of which is Performing the Secular, Religion, Representation, and Politics. Just to round out our understanding of Professor Menon's capacious research interests, allow me to just read a couple of uh, kind of random um, titles of articles that she has written over the past many years. The first one in the Journal of Historical Sociology is titled Queer Selfhoods in the Shadow of Neoliberal Urbanism. Then in Women and Performance, which is another journal, um, a ju uh, an article titled Calling Local, Talking Global, the Cost and Politics of the Call Center Industry. And then in performance research, Toxic Colonialism and the Gesture of Generosity. Dr. Menon received her PhD uh, in drama from Stanford University, her MA in English from JNU in Delhi, and her BA from Bangalore University. And prior to her appointment at Stanford, she was an assistant professor in English at the University of British Columbia. At present, in addition to leading the Center for South Asia, she also is interim director of the Stanford Arts Initiative. And so today's talk is titled, Aesthetics of Waste, Consumer Desire and Its Detritus in India. It is sponsored by the Sarah Kailat Chair of India Studies, the South Asia Art Initiative, and the Department of History of Art. Following Professor Mann's talk, my colleague, Professor Shirata Ray, who is an associate professor in the History of Art Department, will serve as a discussant. Before I actually invite her to the podium, I just want to say it really is always a pleasure to have colleagues come up from the South Bay. And we don't see enough of them, and I think the complaint is a mutual one. Uh, till this wretched Bart does not go all the way around the Bay Area, I unfortunately suspect that we are going to be occupying these islands you know, so close and yet so far. Um, I was just talking to Professor Mann, she told me it took her an hour and a half to come up over here. And I have to say that is really a sign of extraordinary dedication, but more than anything else, generosity, that she would actually give so much time to come up over here. I mean, that's about the extent of a flight to the University of Wisconsin-Madison or something <laughs> like that. In any case, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jisha Menon, both to the Institute and also Berkeley more generally. Thank you. Thanks so much, Muniz, for a very kind introduction. Thanks also to Sugata Ray and uh, Punita and Sanchita for arranging this talk. I actually love coming up to Berkeley, and I used to do that all the time when I was a graduate student at Stanford because I lived in San Francisco, and since we didn't have a South Asia center at Stanford at the time, Berkeley was often you know, a really important sustaining um, 
place for us who worked on South Asia. So it's always great to be here. Uh, the talk I'm giving today is drawn from this new book that I'm uh, writing, which is called Pedestrian Acts. Um, and it's looking at contemporary artworks and the ways in which these artists are critiquing world city paradigms and you know, sort of interrupting this developmental narrative of um, world class cities in India. Um, so I'll start. In his short two minute, 23 seconds, single channel video, The Brief Ascension of Marianne Hussein, renowned Indian artist Vivan Sundaram displays a lively mound of trash. Structured on the concept of a loop, the central image is a three meter high, artistically arranged heap of trash consisting of plastic scraps of diverse colors. After every 10 seconds, a human body is seen higher up in the pile until a light adolescent boy, perhaps a rag picker, emerges from within this garbage heap. The viewer discerns a boy sleeping on a yellow foam mattress perched precariously on top of this makeshift structure which morphs into what appears to be a mountain of refuse. The actor Marianne Hussein is slim, bare-chested, and clad in faded denim jeans. He stretches out and then lurches into the air. In an elegant, almost balletic leap, a motion resembling the grace and power of a superhero. The looping of the video is such that it disallows any complete ascension as the film returns him to the garbage in which he is enmeshed. The living, heaving mound of trash engulfs, then ejects the boy. As the video loop repeats the circular motions, the boy continues to both surmount and then uh, return to the mound of trash. Despite its brevity, Sundaram's single channel video allows the viewer to glimpse the entanglements between commodity aspiration and trash, consumer desire and its detritus, wait, wasted things and wasted people. The imbrication of Marianne Hussein in the waste, his emergence and reincorporation in trash, reveals the ways in which certain human lives are consigned to the realm of waste. Despite the critique against consumer capitalism and its practices of accumulation and disposal, the emergence of the waste picker in the iterable gestures of a superhero inserts a, fi a sense of the verb and vitality, the resilience of those who rise and return to garbage. Grating against the indoctrinated blindness of the in uh, mid middle class consumers to the trash they generate, the flickering specter of Marianne Hussein appears and disappears, a reminder of the precarity of waste pickers. One of the pioneers of installation art in India, uh, Vivan Sundaram actively shaped aesthetic and cultural dialogues around social and political transformation. Sundaram was a founding member of Sehmat, a collective of artists and activists formed in the wake of the assassination of street theater activist Savdar Hashmi in 1989. He was also central to changing paradigms in Indian visual art through his participation in events like the Kasoli workshop in 1976. The relationship between urban growth and garbage has preoccupied Vivan Sundaram for several years now. His work such as Great Indian Bazaar, Living It Out in Delhi, and the multidimensional trash all bring to the fore recycled materials and their entanglements with consumer capitalism, economies of surplus and consequent waste, and the shifting conditions of labor in liberalized India. Sundaram's uh, installation, 12-bed ward, hauntingly captures his engagement with urban detritus and emergent economies of value and waste. Unlike the brief ascension of Marianne Hussein, there is no animation here, no heaving matter, no momentary flight. The stillness and gravitas of the large dormitory-style installation, 12-bed ward, uncovers an alternative arrangement of affect and desire. The viewer enters a gray, sterile, and solemn ward with 12 metal beds, six on either side of a wide aisle. Across the aisle at the end of the room stands an unoccupied metal chair, remote, austere, and magisterial, erect in its capacity to preside over and survey the horizontal beds. Each bed holds worn out soles of discarded shoes arranged in patterns the soles, some solitary, others nestled in pairs, are tautly stitched together with black thread and fitted to the frame of an iron bed. They are then suspended horizontally on the bed frame to provide an illusory sense of a ravished mattress composed of worn out soles suspended in midair. A low hanging exposed voltage bulb 
illumines each one, <coughs> casting a filigree pattern of looming shadows of immobilized spectral footprints. <coughs> the play of naked light and ominous shadows, the exposure and display of innards, the recuperated soles of ravaged shoes, the haunting silence and stillness of this installation induces an atmosphere of sinister foreboding. Each soul tells its own unique story, the impress, the wear, the height of the heel, intimating a sense of the ghosted owner of the shoes. Some facing the viewers, others looking down. These souls convey the many unexpected journeys undertaken by the owners. They also reveal the multiple lives of the, shoe, uh, of the souls from street side repair to disaggregation, recycling, decomposition to restoration. The installation stages the ghosted encounters between hands and feet, the arduous care with which the manual laborers deftly separate soul for the informal recycling economy. The scene of salvage capitalism evokes the sensuous precarity of recyclers as they jeopardize their own health in order to eke out a perilous living. The clean precision of Ivan Sundaram's installation, its geometric lines, and the sterility of the institutional setting appears to contradict the affective unruliness of its subject matter. Yet its very meticulousness, ironically, evokes a range of messy and anarchic intensities. This installation brings together the uncanny atmosphere of an empty institutional ward, the menacing power that exudes from the solitary chair, the bleakness and sense of vulnerable exposure of the salvaged souls that resemble bare entrails, organs, and viscera obscenely on display. The spare aesthetic register at work here, uh, so distinct from the earlier piece, offers no reprieve, no uplift, and only exposes the brave aftermath of consumer capitalism. <coughs> Commenting on Sundaram's work, Chaitanya Sambrani reminds us that the history of urbanity is linked to the archaeology of trash. Trash is the logical telos of consumer society and its ethos of planned obsolescence. Sundaram's powerful installation of exposed souls in 12-bed ward and the recalcitrant figure of Maria Hussein in the video loop bring together what Sambrani refers to as the subversive economy of reuse and salvage and what Saloni Mathur describes as necessary strategies of survival within capitalism. What artist Vivan Sundaram refers to as a death-like chamber is more like a purgatory, uh, a temporary and liminal space where salvaged souls are given new life and enter into new circuits of value. Focusing on the infra-politics of the informal economy of the recyclers, these critics attend to the ways in which recyclers turn the trash of the wealthy into the means of renewal and livelihood. The presence of the souls in this art installation underscores not only the vision and talent of Vivan Sundaram, but also the creativity, skill, and craftsmanship of the recycler. India's recyclers like Marian Hussain in Sundaram's video loop tell the dark stories of India shining. The stories of garbage pickers, Sunil Kalu Abdul eloquently captured in Catherine Boo's Pulitzer winning nonfiction book Beneath, uh, Behind the uh, Beautiful Forevers allow us to glimpse the aspirations and despairs that guide the lives of waste pickers like Marian Hussain. Sunil, Kalu, and Abdul, along with a host of other lively characters, live in the murky informal settlement Annavadi that houses 3,000 residents on swampy reclaimed land bordering a sewage cesspool behind the international airport and glitzy luxury hotels in Mumbai. It is in the shadowy squalor of the glittering metropolis that Sunil and Abdul scrape by and make a living as garbage pickers. Living in this slum was an improvisational art form that demonstrated a dexterous <coughs> capacity to dodge adversity. Quotes, in Anavadi, fortunes derived not just from what people did or how well they did it, but from the accidents and catastrophes they avoided. A decent life was the train that hadn't hit you, the slum lord you hadn't offended, the malaria you hadn't caught. Close quote. This is Catherine Lee. This sprawling urban slum is home to a range of characters who ex exhibit audacity, resilience, humor, and vitality, but are not immune to the crushing opportunism, corruption, and injustice that they de navigate daily in their midst. In David Hare's 2014 dramatic adaptation of Boo's account at the National Theatre in London, the figure of Abdul, whose growing ethical probity is set against that of Sunil, whose risk-taking is fueled by the promise of the good life in contemporary Mumbai. 
Both Abdul and Sunil are made acutely aware of the looming violence around them at the hands of gangsters, corrupt police, jealous neighbors, and local politicians. The relentless production of fantasies of good life in liberalized India bring images of wealth and success tantalizingly close to its urban underclass. Yet for the waste pickers, these fantasies do not deliver. Rather, they exacerbate the sense of acute deprivation in the midst of proliferating mediascapes of affluence and growing mountains of urban detritus. Since it requires minimal training, prior knowledge, or capital investment, waste picking is a widespread occupation performed by multitudes of impoverished, di uh, dispossessed, and desperate Indian citizens. Um, According to the Solid Waste Management Rules Association, a waste picker is defined as a person or groups of persons informally engaged in collection and recovery of re uh, reusable or recyclable solid waste from the source of waste generation uh, for sale to recyclers directly or through intermediaries to earn their livelihood. The waste pickers in India include a vast array of workers who labor in a range of waste practices from sewage to scavenging to recycling to electronic waste. The figure of the kabadiwala, an itinerant and resourceful door-to-door -door buyer of unwanted goods, is entrenched in the imaginary of those growing up in uh, India. The increasing pressure to privatize waste management through technocratic solutions threatens to eclipse such professions with the looming risk that professions deemed informal will soon also be rendered illegal. These artworks index not only the artist's ability to remake urban detritus into things of beauty, they also provide a reminder of the ingenuity and creativity of the waste picker and the recycler. In their hands, discarded things of waste acquire new life and value. Technocratic solutions <coughs> to formalize waste management will eclipse opportunities for waste pickers to have even this limited access to sources of renewal and potential capital. Rough estimates put the figure of India's waste pickers uh, at 3.5 million in uh, 2011. Marianne Hussain, the rag picker in the video, is associated with the NGO group Chintan, uh, Chintan Environmental Action and Research Group, and he apprenticed with the, uh, with the artist Vivan Sundaram. Chintan has made important interventions in finding ways to empower communities who work with waste. In addition to empowering those who work in recycling, they also create programs to increase awareness and education programs, etc. Um, India's thriving NGO sectors, of which Chintan is a prime example, are crucial players that coordinate recycling in cities and work with uh, waste pickers, not only to manage India's growing garbage problem, but also to empower the urban <coughs> underclass and give them a life of dignity, in their words. Vivan Sundaram works closely with Chintan, and his artworks offer a reminder of the important work that impoverished recyclers perform in imagining sustainable <coughs> urban futures. Economic liberalization greatly increased the sheer volume of commodities and hence of waste generated by the nation. In their book, Waste of a Nation, Doran and Jeffrey, inform us that the average American created 150 times more waste each year than the average Indian, while US produced 250 million metric tons of waste per year, India generated 65 million tons. But given its population density, the problem is especially urgent in India. So I am going to turn to look at artworks that uh, take up the question of electronic waste in Bangalore, which is well known as the technology hub in India. So uh, with regards to electronic waste, India generates more than 2 million tons while also importing it from wealthier nations. The arrival of mass television in 1990 augured the incipience of the e-waste informal industry and accelerated after the spread of mobile phones beginning in the uh, start of 21st century. Prior to economic liberalization, hazardous wealth in India, including chemicals and contaminated metals, amounted to about four or five million metric tons. The US at that time generated 275 million metric tons, um, while India's hazardous waste in 2015 was estimated at around eight million metric tons a year. The waste pickers in India's informal economy process more than 95% of this electronic waste. 
When waste pickers dismantle and process e-waste without proper precautions, its toxic constituents damage health and in many cases cause respiratory related deaths in recycling communities. Unskilled workers not only work without any protection measure or safeguards, but also live in slums close to the untreated e-waste dumps and landfills. Usually children dismantle the circuit boards. The scientific extraction of valuable metals such as copper, silver, gold, platinum, has driven an underground economy of illegal scavenging for precious metals through waste pickers who have a limited understanding of the toxicity and carcinogenic properties of the substances. The required techniques for segregating precious metals uh, involve solder stripping, acid baths, and they often uh, handle these substances without gloves or masks. Uh, moreover, they live in informal settlements that are usually contiguous to these uh, e-waste dumps. Um, the vast informal network of players at every node in the electronic waste recycling industry involves middlemen, contractors, subcontractors, and these okay. informal labor networks typically become family affairs with women and children often doing most of the delicate and hazardous jobs. Prior to liberalization, India's cultural values of frugality and customs of reuse ensured a check on practices of consumption and disposal. Indian nationalist leaders like Gandhi and Nehru often converged on hygiene as a crucial economic and moral signifier of the nation's modernity. Both Gandhi and Nehru extolled the virtues of prudence and frugality and the importance of not wasting away the nation's resources. Um, of, of course, Prime Minister Modi has promised to deliver Swachh Bharat by next month. Uh, that's 2019, October, in celebration of the 150th anniversary of Gandhi. Stitching together developmental, civic, and moral discourses, the campaign to clean India appeals to what Amitabh Babaskar refers to as bourgeois environmentalism, while also appealing to Indians, overseas, and middle-class citizens. But no account of growth and garbage is complete without an understanding of the ways in which the waste papers uh, themselves begin to be identified not only uh, with trash but also as trash. The association with trash metonymically transfers to the personhood of waste pickers, and like the materials they work with, they too are deemed as trash. As <coughs> Catherine book, uh, Boo's book demonstrates, some of India's most precarious citizens, waste pickers routinely navigate economic exploitation, social discrimination, poor sanitation, and the recyclers and others who work with and in waste constitute the very bottom of India's hierarchical society. Waste pickers often belong to the Dalit community, formerly classified as untouchables, although untouchability is illegal since the Indian Constitution's abolition in 1950, Prejudice against Dalit communities pervades Indian society and continues to stigmatize these populations. For caste, Hindus' waste is associated with ritual pollution, and the figure of the waste picker blurs the boundaries between human and waste, inside and outside, person and thing. Other communities working with waste include lower caste uh, people, impoverished Muslims, and India's religious minorities. Some travel to cities as displaced landless migrants in wake of the agrarian crises. These communities often live in informal settlements adjacent to mounds of rubbish akin to the one depicted in the video by the Bang Sundaram. Uh, while waste pickers are generally associated with poverty and deprivation, their occupations of recycling also constitute a set of cultural practices. So today I want to turn to the work of um, uh, Surekha Sharada was an artist who works out of Bangalore um, and she sort of looks at the ways in which artworks can register some of these civic and urban transformations. So she's uh, someone who has coordinated a lot of public interactive projects and she um, um, she's the founding curator of Rangoli Metro Center which is part of the new metro project that's ongoing in Bangalore. It's a public art space which includes theater space as well as a crafts market, art galleries, outdoor playing space for children, um, and her other sort of projects that relate to urban history include a city in transit, making of the metro, one and two, building Bangalore, among others. 
So in the pieces that I want to look at, uh, I want to think of how Sureka takes up this question of what Zygmunt Bauman calls wasted lives in the urban metropolises of India. By placing center stage, the discarded object of spent desire, the abjected useless thing that ends up in a garbage dump, she brings into imaginative focus the highly exclusionary social worlds that are engendered through spatial and social demarcations of hygiene and filth, of privilege and poverty, of technology and tradition. So Rekha considers the ecological effects of the current urban preoccupations with innovation, speed, and enhancement. How does one represent the deliberate, slow-moving effects of ecological disasters that are often insidious and invisible? What are the human ecological consequences of the current valorization of innovation and its cultures of disposal? What are some creative and critical measures that people take to make something new of these entanglements? So her work turns explicitly to the city of her residence, Bangalore, through short films on the disappearing lakes in the city, such as her Jakur Lake project, or Nobody's Walls, or We Are the Environment, among others, she takes up the issue of the rapid transformation of the city. So to talk a little bit about Bangalore city itself and why it becomes you know, sort of uh, something that these artists are looking to, it's a city that has seen radical urban transformations from being described as the pensioner's paradise <coughs> and the garden city to the images that evoke rest and retreat uh, after the frenzy and tumult of life's work to an image that grows so rapidly that it eludes even our conceptual grasp on it. From an earlier somnolent rhythm of life, it has suddenly transformed into this high-velocity, high-tech capital of um, India with a dizzying velocity of transnational traffic in capital, media, commodities, people. Bangalore's reputation as a scientific capital can be traced back to the early decades of post-independence India, the first public sector enterprise. Indian, inst uh, Indian telephone industries was established in Bangalore in 1948, and other um, public sector undertakings include uh, Hindustan Aeronautical Limited, Bharat Electronics Limited, so it has this kind of garnered a kind of reputation for being a science city. And it's received a lot of uh, the government's financial and infrastructural investment in science and technology. Um, there have been several R&D institutes such as uh, Central Power Research Institute and the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, um, National Center for Biological Sciences, in addition to institutes such as IISC, the Indian Institute of Science, Vishweshwara College of Engineering, among others that have kind of created this image of Bangalore as a premier destination for science. The liberalization of the Indian economy projected Bangalore as India's Silicon Valley. It is home, of course, to numerous IT companies, including uh, local companies like Wipro and Infosys, as well as multinationals like Hewlett Packard, IBM. Um, and uh, jointly undertaken by India and Singapore, the creation of an international tech park in Whitefield was set up in 1994 that also created the conditions for a proliferation of IT companies in the region. Uh, so once imagined as idyll and repose from work, it has grown to a kind of non-stop, 24-7 kind of work culture that normalizes productivity without pause and labor without rest. While Bangalore has established this reputation as high-tech capital of India, when it comes to <coughs> India's increasingly global art scene, Bangalore is not an obvious place <coughs> to look at. Um, unlike New Delhi, Kolkata, Baroda, Chennai, or Mumbai, Bangalore is not renowned for its art institutions, gallery system, or state or privately owned museum culture. While it does uh, have some innovative and established gallery spaces, such as Ski, Sumukha, Tasveer, NGMA, Venkatapa Art Gallery, um, the vast majority of them, the galleries, just cater to Bangalore's increasingly affluent consumer market. However, the city does pride itself on its uh, artist-based cooperatives where artists come together through jointly owned uh, and democratically run alliances. <coughs> this is just a picture of the artist Sureka with uh, Suresh Jairam and uh, Suresh Kumar. 
So such cooperatives bring alternative aesthetic values and exemplify what Shannon Jackson, your colleague here at Berkeley, calls infrastructural politics of performance that conjoin aesthetic and social dimensions. The art scene in Bangalore is distinctive for its lateralized system of peer support through associations, residencies, and more informal channels of feedback and critical nurture. <coughs> One of the pioneers of uh, such an associational civil society is Surekha's teacher and mentor, Rudrapa Mallapa Hadapad, who insisted on the importance of collaboration in the formation of an arts practice. And he was a pivotal figure in the formation of a supportive, uh, supportive peer community of artists in Bangalore. In 1968, he founded Ken School and espoused a philosophy of art as a way of life rather than as an object-based practice, something Surekha takes quite seriously. Rather than create museum-ready pieces, he encouraged the use of art uh, as a means of remaking society through deliberate pedagogical, social, and political interventions. Hadapad uh, energized the art scene in Bangalore through taking on institutional positions, fostering associational ties among artists, and promoting pedagogical and mentoring practices between generations. Um, so the relational aesthetics that, uh, that you see here are not necessarily circumscribed to the artworks, but rather social relations that take on uh, qualities of nurture, care, and support. Uh, Surekha imbibes much of Hadabat's vision and its a vibrant and dynamic member of Bangalore's public and community arts practice. In her video installation, Unclaimed and Other Urban Frictions, Surekha presents four stories that uh, expose the obverse of a constant obsession with innovation, youth, and newness in the city. She provides us with succinct portrayals of social abandonment. For the installation, she created walls of discarded computer keyboards with wires dangling listlessly in front of them. In a different room, she lined up and stacked up computer monitors in rows adjacent to and on top of each other. The films were screened on large white screen in a separate room. Some of the monitors were so arranged so as to create separate little viewing alcoves. The standardized replicable objects of electronic waste are neatly arranged. They appear like stacked, packaged, ready-for-sale commodities in an electronic warehouse. <coughs> this is the environment where Surika screens her films that meditate on technological and human obsolescence in the city. Upturning the focus on innovation, she illustrates a range of outmoded entities through her film series. This is an image from one of the films. The unclaimed dead, the laughing elder, the elderly be beggar woman who's an unnecessary element, and finally electronic waste, which in the hands of recyclers is transformed into refurbished electronic goods. Treated like obsolete entities, the elderly, the beggars, the dead, and the e-waste acquire spectral valence as things that have lost their use and are now discarded. By linking living with the dead, the human with waste, Surekha illumines a culture of utilitarianism that discards all things that have purportedly lost their instrumental value. The assemblage of humans, technology, and waste in her artworks allow us to see how humans themselves are conceived as waste. In her short film, Resource, made in 2009, she deals directly with the question of electronic waste in the city. A single uh, channel video, this brief documentary, sketches out the activities of ash recyclers jointly run by Syed Hussain and Kumar in Bangalore. In Resource, she demonstrates the ways in which discarded computers are carefully dismantled and then refurbished and reanimated into new objects. The entrepreneurs at Ash Recyclers repurpose locally sourced available technology and create new low-cost technological products with them. Ash Recyclers demonstrate the ways in which they reuse and reimagine, thus providing frugal innovations for developing economies. Her film suggests that these recyclers should not only be considered entrepreneurial, but also as artistic in their skilled technical craftsmanship and creative proficiency. In ragi.net, she turns specifically to the ways in which the information technology industry displaces and marginalizes farmers in the city. Ragi.net draws out eco-critical themes that Surekha explores in her prior work. In this artwork, 
Uh, she brings together discourses surrounding the high-tech city, agrarian crisis, and effects of urbanization on rural communities. Uh, it was part of the dual exhibition, Post Oil City, The History of the City's Future, and Bangalore Gardens Reloaded, exhibited in Vishweshwara uh, Industrial and Tech Museum in Bangalore in February 2013. Um, artists were invited to present works that grapple with environment friendly solutions to problems of urbanization and other artists in this exhibition included uh, Suresh Kumar, Surekha Bharatesh, GD, Dimple Shah, Suresh Jairam, Aisha Abraham, among others. In this project, Surekha grows ragi, or finger millet, out of abandoned computer keyboards. Um, ragi is a widely grown crop native to Karnataka, which accounts for 64% of the total production of ragi in India. It is resilient to attack by insects and mold, and its durability, its nutritional value, and its sturdiness makes it a vital crop among poorer farming communities in Karnataka who enjoy ragi rotis, uh, bread made of ragi. Due to the rampant development of Bangalore as India's information technology city, many ragi fields are seized from farmers and converted into technology parks to service the real estate needs of the IT industry. In Surekha's words, Bangalore has been my city. I was born and brought up here. I was born into a peasant's family, and my ancestors must have stayed here for at least 200 years. Over the years, I have seen the transformation of Bangalore, particularly its rural areas. I have witnessed the city taking over the village. My parents lost their land and had to adapt to new ways of living and working. So for this project, Surekha collaborated with the farmer and artist Subramani. They sourced the keyboards from an e-waste shop in Vartur village, an area which once lay in the very urban outskirts of the city. The real estate development in the area displaced villages of Vartur and converted them into IT parks, international schools, and elite residential enclaves. In Ragi.net, rather than IT firms springing up on Ragi farmland, Surekha inverts the process and experiments with Ragi sprouting on discarded black, gray, and white keyboards instead. Along with Subramani the farmer, she grows Ragi the gaps and holes of the upside-down computer keyboards. For the installation, Surekha upturns the computer boards, separates the individual keys like miniature cups that hold brown granular grains of Ragi. The rich green Ragi plant sprouts from the separated keyboards. Introducing artworks to scores of non-elite viewers who visit the museum daily, these artworks provide an opportunity for, reflect, uh, for visitors to reflect on the changing urban scapes of their city. Surika does not braid computer hardware and agriculture into a harmonious image, a utopic commingling of farming and technology. Bringing together the budding plant and discarded hardware into a living dead sculpture um, the tightly wound charger cords around the keyboards evokes a sense of its strangulation that simultaneously displays the obdurate generativity of organic crops and the obsolescence of technological products. For Surekha, the sculpture signifies the ways in which technology encroaches upon and damages generative sources of food, energy, and sustenance. The miniaturized artworks rescales the human viewer who now looms over the ecotech sculpture as an oversized giant with an aerial view of the disaggregated plots of ragi. The choice to separate and parcel out the little plots of ragi offers a god's eye view of disconnected and individuated plots of farmland. <coughs> Through a series of choices, giganticism of the viewer, the disaggregation of the plots of ragi, the flowering of ragi with the discarded keyboards line, Surekha reminds the viewer of the social and spatial displacements that have occurred in Bangalore City as a result of the growing usurpation of land for IT industry. The sculpture forces the viewer to consider the ecological ramifications of development projects that harm the ecologies of uh, farmers in the outskirts of the city. The monstrosity of the human viewer makes her recognize a life force gone awry, a <coughs> gigantic anthropocentrism that dominates and controls nature rather than exists in reciprocal harmony with animate ecosystems. 
The disaggregation of the unified computer keyboards also points to the social repercussions of isolating farm laborers. The separation of plots of land mimetically reflects the ways in which laborers who toil on discrete plots are increasingly segregated from other farmers, made individually responsible for their own successes and failures. Such personalization of success and failure deflects the onus of poverty and de uh, deprivation from systemic factors to more individual ones. These techniques of social control, of isolating farmers, of enervating trade unionism, of indoctrinating a personal responsibility for poverty, <coughs> systematically and structurally exploit and dispossess farmers in the high-tech city. In addition, by disaggregating that which belongs together, <coughs> she exposes the ways in which the usurpation <coughs> of farmlands by real estate agents fragment the organic interconnectedness of food, land, and community. Surekha portrays the ways in which technology farms encroach on and build its empire on squandered homes, fields, and livelihoods of farmers and villagers. Literally turning technology on its head, her sculpture meditates on what David Harvey refers to as accumulation by dispossession and considers the ways in which farmers are displaced from their homes. Collaborating with a farmer enables Sureka to create a, a piece that speaks pointedly to the agrarian crisis within the region and its relationship to unchecked development. The multiple effects of India's agrarian crisis include footloose migration, despair-driven exodus from the countryside, the collapse of millions of livelihoods in agriculture and its related occupations. Between 1991 and 2001, over 7 million people for whom cultivation was the main livelihood quit farming. On average, close to 2,000 people abandon farming daily in the country. Farmer suicides are rising even as the numbers of farmers is shrinking. Between 1995 and 2010, India witnessed over a quarter of a million with a baseline of 15,000 farmer suicides each year since 2001. That's roughly two, uh, 45 farmer suicides daily. Economic desperation and the emotional turmoil it gen generates amongst impoverished farming communities make them frantic to overcome conditions of indebtedness and perhaps even have a shot at the success and wealth they see unfold around them. Surekha's sculpture of the discarded keyboards, outgrown by Ragi Sprouts, encourages us to think about despair-driven migrations, suicides and agrarian crisis and its relationship to aspiration booming in the high-tech city. <coughs> the ragi crop itself is increasingly scarce as ragi farmlands are appropriated for purposes of real estate development. So to conclude, by considering the relationship between want and waste, Sureka evokes the ghosts that are occluded in the progressivist discourses of technology and development. Situated at the conjuncture of urban and rural, agriculture and technology, poverty and development, the scenarios of waste we encounter here, from waste pickers to farmers and the other collateral casualties of economic liberalization, that's Marlin's term, that they're all deemed as disposable, as obsolete, as trash. Thank you. It's really a fascinating uh, project that, that opens up the question of the role of trash in our everyday lives. Now we return to the title of your talks, The Aesthetics mm -hmm. of Waste. So I wonder, what is the difference between aesthetics and reportage? Mm -hmm. Do you see, is there an aesthetics of waste here? Mm -hmm. Or are these artists merely, or not merely, are these artists reporting? Are mm -hmm. these artists reporters? Or are, what is an aesthetics of waste? Especially I'm thinking about a long history of artistic projects that have engaged ways. For instance, Arte Povera. And in the 1960s and 70s, for instance, there were artists who were working with textiles, waste textiles. Or even in contemporary practices, the idea of recycling, working with waste is something that we see in South America, we see in uh, Africa. So I wonder, what is the aesthetics? Is there a certain history of these aesthetics that you are trying to map out? And how do we talk about aesthetics beyond reporting mm -hmm. as a project of narrating mm -hmm. stories through material. It's mm -hmm. a great question. Uh, well, I think one of the things that I wanted to do in this project is to look at um, you know, how these um, 
open up spaces, these particular artworks allow us to encounter these artworks and see if there are ways in which they may begin to trouble some kind of unifying ideas that we may have about uh, development, etc. Right? So there are in India numerous artists who are taking up this challenge of talking about um, the <coughs> world class city in ways that both perpetuate that same model, which is to say, look, we're all kind of global artists and our work is sort of making sure that India is at the next level of development. So there are those kinds of projects. And then there are other kinds of projects that are trying to critique it. <laughs> and even those projects may be more complex than just whether it's critiquing or you know, incorporated within, because there's space even within these projects, like Sureka's projects, where you can Sometimes it's a bit ambivalent of whether she's perpetuating that world class city discourse or if she's critiquing it. And I think in terms of aesthesis, what's interesting to me is that many of these artists actually turn to uh, materials um, and so that it becomes a way to encounter these questions not through uh, paintings or figurative narrations but through very textural materials. And that, you know, I mean, if you look at aesthesis as a non-anesthetic kind of environment, they're giving you a very sensuous environment to encounter these artworks. Um, and I think that pushing that further, I'm interested in how these waste pickers themselves are configured as artists in these works, so that you have a sense of not the sort of uh, conception of them as just, you know, wasted people who are completely identified with the waste that they're producing, but also as creative people. So it's not just a sense of, you know, sort of uh, homo laborans or that kind of laboring uh, person who then becomes overly identified <coughs> with waste and as waste, but also as a person who makes art, right, like of poesis, some kind of making is involved in this process. So when you're seeing, or it offers an opportunity to look at waste because not merely as these kind of abject, uh, non-human, or sort of somehow just bare life, but also thinking of them as creative, as um, people who may even have some kind of artistic sensibility in sorting, you know, collecting, and all those sorts of Position. So that's kind of where the ideas go in. Right. I mean, uh, the, the specific projects that you select certainly are, in a way, a, pro a product of the neoliberal or a response to the neoliberal economy of post 90s. And uh, Vivan's trash is certainly mm -hmm. reflecting. But Vivan, Vivan, uh, Vivan's trash, I mean, in a certain way, has precedence. In fact, much before these words were even used in the 1960s and the 70s. There were artists who were working with this. So I wonder how much of that, of this, this new turn to trash, if you want to actually use that term, is, is that a direct reflection of certain economic practices that have emerged after the 90s? And how much of it is a conversation within a certain practice that perhaps even takes us 40 years back, mm -hmm. I mean, when when you had artists working with trash, in a way, and the word used was trash, much before we one used the word trash mm -hmm. in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, in a way, push you to think about the genealogies of this practice that perhaps transcend the specific narrative of neoliberal economies that lead. And, and I, my reason, in a certain way, is also to think about artistic practice beyond that sort of a very direct one is to one instrumental mm -hmm. relationship, but to think about the very practice of of, of putting trash together. I mean, we, s we saw it in, 19, in the 1960s in a way. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that would be a product. I, I'm curious what you yeah. would. I mean, I think it would be. This, this particular chapter is looking at trash, and then other chapters look at other kinds of ecological, or sorry, uh, other kinds of civic issues that, you know, crop up in post-liberal India. So the focus has been liberalized India and how the you know sort of um, aesthetic sensibility even changes. So we can begin to think of 
neoliberalism itself, not merely as an economic or social phenomenon, but also as an aesthetic phenomenon. So how can we look at this as a kind of a po uh, point of rupture to think of how people are not only making works, but in my uh, larger work, the focus is also on how new subjects are formed, right? So how is um, not only how is Vivan Sundaram making waste or trash, but how is the trash making him? So the focus returns on subject formation. So how is something like waste allowing us to rethink of who is actually human, rather than a, you know necessarily a kind of aesthetic? Uh, so my project is sort of, I would say, um, in the vein of a kind of cultural materialism, drawing on Raymond Williams, where you sort of think about it not necessarily only within an aesthetic frame, but also see how is the sort of wider currents of culture and politics um, you know, creating certain categories. So within this uh, chapter, and the larger work looks at you know, Krishna Chona, who's another Bangladesh artist who works with electronic waste, uh, and he looks at the transnational uh, itineraries of electronic waste uh, to see how you know, sort of Asia becomes the dumping ground for a lot of um, electronic waste. In fact, it's called the dustbin of the world. And then you start clear of Philippines. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so the larger project is also <coughs> to think about you know, how are these objects that we make, how are they making us? And so I think waste becomes specifically you know, very, very generative in that it is something where the imbrication between the human and non-human gets really porous because we can see how in this kind of uh, environmental sensibility or in this even you know what Amitabh Babaskar calls bourgeois environmentalism, we have ways in which now there are middle class subjects who are now turning into environmental activists and a whole, you know, it doesn't even have to be necessarily you know, just the bourgeois environmentalists who are kind of elite and want their garden city back. But there might be other offshoots of that project. For instance, there's a tree festival in Bangalore. So it's not necessarily just, you know, something that we need to dismiss, but there can be many kinds of effects from that. Um, and, you know, so I think that in order to look at how these are aesthetic projects for the making of persons and making of subjects, it becomes something that has to go beyond the aesthetic realm and it, like as an uh, kind of insulated art realm to think of the way in which something like waste uh, allows you to see certain categories of people who are associated as waste as only subhuman. Mm -hmm. And then the whole project of environmental activism where you know, I mentioned Chintan, for instance, where the rhetoric is always of returning dignity to the waste pickers, <coughs> as if by giving them dignity, they need to enfold them within the human. So there is a kind of uh, dialectic going on between this conception of the waste and conception of the person that I'm also trying to dig into, so that that becomes a way in which the human is made through the interaction with waste, or even you know. Upper <laughs> caste sensibilities are made by that which you abject or that which you discard, mm -hmm. or an uh, environmental subjectivity is formed by you know that which you uh, iteratively perform. So then, ultimately, it goes back to that kind of performativity. You know, how are these subjects um, con consolidated through these kinds of iterative practices? How does being a waste picker consolidate <laughs> that caste? So if I may sort of pick up on the last point and something that I am trying to work through with my, in my own research is the question of the subject. And if we think about Jane Bennett's work, is there a human subject? I mean, I, you, you sort of brought up the idea of the living versus the dead, but yeah. the computer, that, that, that particular keyboard is living. It's not dead. Yeah. It's animate in a way. If, if we follow new materialism and Jane Bennett, I wonder what, where is the human subject here? But if we are to take seriously, the fact is that the trash makes us as much, and you did say that the, the trash makes the artist, mm -hmm. but not in a metaphoric, political way, but in a very biophysical way, our body mm -hmm. is transformed via trash. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that idea of vital materialism that Jane Bennett and many <coughs> scholars working with object-oriented on ontology have brought up, mm -hmm. the question of that trash can no longer be seen in opposition to life, 
and that opposition of life and death that plays out in this work, in a way, sort of disguises the fact that computer screens make us mm -hmm. and change us mm -hmm. on an everyday basis. So I wonder how would that play out in the formation of this so-called human subject that we are so stuck to in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other piece that I look at, which is Krishnaraj Chonat's uh, sculpture, which is called My Hands Smell of You, which is about the labor of, uh, you know, sort of detangling and uh, un bringing apart all of these electronic waste that the waste pickers are doing, and the ways in which the waste literally gets into the skin of these uh, waste pickers. And it smells of that skin, and, you know, so it very much is about what is the binary between the waste and the human, that these are porous categories, so that now my hands literally smell of you, as in because it's a, a critique of transnational uh, waste dumping and the way in which that you know, possibly yeah. Western subject has dumped the computer hardware or whatever, which has been shipped to India or other poorer nations where you have these recyclers who are engaged in these kinds of jobs. And it has literally penetrated the skin of the human, so that now it's not even clear what chemicals have now been absorbed. So all of this discussion around, you know, sort of uh, preserving life, etc., is very much tied to a particular conception of the boundary between the human and the chemical. Although these chemicals are penetrating the skin and making those distinctions kind of porous. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of the waste, because, you know, they actually argue that they're not even interested in the gloves or the masks that um, the state is mandating that they wear, but they are more interested in just someone buying their stuff and protesting against some of these practices of trying to formalize uh, waste economies, because then that would mean that they would be deprived of their livelihoods. So these agitations, you know, you can see them as certain kinds of biopolitical agitations in, you know, in terms of what is life, what whose life is worth something, you know, in, in this whole transnational dynamic, for instance, when you have people shipping global e-waste across to Asia, there's a conception that those lives in the first world are valuable, so let's just ship the stuff to countries where the life expectancy is low anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of logic. So even in India, you have these uh, protests. There was um, in Bangalore, someone who um, protested against um, waste pickers. Not sorry, not waste pickers, but against this kind of mess, the waste and the trash that's not really collected, etc. And she argued for Article 21, which is right to, it's a violation of her right to life and, um, and healthy environment where again the you know the uh, response from the court was to make sure that she um, you know that they go to scientific solutions to deal with the problem of waste management where again you know what happens is you forget about the waste because they become kind of irrelevant to this conversation about whose life is worth preserving um, and so again you know the idea that certain lives are rendered kind of unvaluable, right. invaluable becomes something that's a returning kind of theme in many of these books. So, so to return to the, I'm trying to work through certain terms. So what if we supplemented trash with found object? Would it do the same kind of discursive work for you? Uh, Vivankur is, of course, someone who's worked ex extensively with found objects. And that was, in a sense, a term that was in circulation that shaped certain kinds of artistic practices. It produced, for instance, um, installation as installation, at least in the South Asian context. Um, and thinking about trash again comes via Vivan, right? Uh, and, and then it enters within a certain discursive domain. So if we took that term away and supplemented it with found object, which has a certain history of not just reuse, but jugar, um, it speaks of a certain kind of um, 
return of debris to life, which is what Vivan also is doing. It's taking trash and putting it back into circulation within uh, the realm of contemporary art as a Surik. Um, so if we, if we shifted the terms, would that, would that discursively change the argument made for it? I, um, I'm not sure, you know, because a lot of these found objects have been discarded, right? So, so if they're found objects that have been discarded and deemed as trash or no longer valuable, then I think the argument would still hold. I started thinking of some of the other works that I wouldn't actually call trash because it would just sort of militate against that. Like, you know, like Sheila Gowda has this beautiful piece called Stopover where she works with grinding stones that are technically uh, objects that have been thrown out from homes in Bangalore. These were grinding stones that are absolutely beautiful and aesthetic that as the houses <coughs> modernize the uh, you know, occupants or whoever was trying to sell the house will just displace them. But they're very anxious about destroying them because there's the sacral charge that they feel that these grinding stones exude. So Sheila Gauda and uh, her partner Christoph Storrs create this beautiful sculpture around the, um, the grinding stones that are found objects, they are discarded, but I would not call them trash, right? Because that, that is something that I think would still uh, be something that they wouldn't use, the people who have display, discarded them wouldn't use, so it wouldn't be something um, that I may think of as trash. The other example that comes to mind is Aisha Abraham's work with the found footage of home videos, which are also, you know, things that she has just found of old movies, home movies. And again, she was one of the artists who uh, displayed in the same uh, exhibition that Surika exhibited in. But again, I don't know that I would refer to it as trash. They are found objects. There's something that someone discarded. Um, so I think it's a, it's a bit nebulous where one would situate the found object and trash. But it's a good question to think with. Nice. So you know, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if you can help me think this through a little bit. Um, I see the participation of the rack because the scavengers, you know, people who are you know, bringing this material mm -hmm. into big dumps. Mm -hmm. I, I see where their participation lies. But I don't really get a sense of their aesthetic vision, their artistic agency mm -hmm. in, in any of these works, mm -hmm. beyond the fact that you have a boy who's being told to jump out and you know, still photographs are being made of him. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious if there's any sort of conversation or commentary that these artists afford us to give a sense that they're not just talking about, you know, inanimate objects, or not even inanimate objects, but, you know, individuals, objects that they themselves are shaping in a certain kind of way for us to then consume without really taking into account the fact that these individuals who are actually doing the picking and, you know, whose, whose things are being bought by these artists, or at least collected by these artists, in to what extent do does their vision play itself out in, in this kind of a story? I think, um, you know, I don't think that there's any direct way in which their vision would be uh, manifested in these artworks. <coughs> I think what they allow is a space or an opening for the viewer to come in and sort of contemplate and reflect on what may be um, something we can take away from these works. So I think it's something that, you know, you sort of bring as a viewer, I mean, you could very well just walk right past it and not be particularly impressed with any of it or thoughtful or think about what maybe some of the idea uh, ideas or discourses that may be impinging on some of these works, like the uh, uh, Suleka's Ragi.net. You could not necessarily dwell on it, but I think these are just openings that are possible. So you know, within the realm of what can these works allow a viewer who takes some time to think about it. I think, you know, if you're sort of talking up about this kind of city that provides kind of 24-7 rush of constant work culture, remember Bangalore City, hub of call centers, you know, where there's literally a kind of nighttime clock that's also ticking. I think these works 
for me, provide an opportunity to just sort of be still for a moment and allow you to have some time to reflect, whereas otherwise you're just caught in this kind of temporal cycle. No, I understand that. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of, you know, I mean, the kind of objectified objectification that comes with National Geographic, right? Or, you know, Europeans, Americans who go to the third world and take pictures of happy natives or exotic natives, right? And then present a story based on, you know, a certain um, vision that they have encountered. And I'm just wondering to what extent, I mean, as, aside from the fact that these artists are offering us a vista into a world of objects, I'm just kind of curious to what degree the critique that we would have of a National Geographic photographer, you know, taking, appropriating, creating something new, does not actually also to some degree apply to some of the artists themselves who are working uh, with objects without actually giving a certain amount of real agency to the people who are doing the rack picking, you know, and, and you know, I, I mean, I'm just yeah. thinking aloud here, I'm just riffing, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that one, one uh, way to respond to the question is to think of who are their, uh, who are they working with, who are they collaborating with? So if you see Vivan Sundaram working with Marianne Hussain, or you see Surekha working with the farmer. So there are collaborations that are going on where they're, you know, they're not necessarily just objectifying these people. They're also in relationships that are a little bit different than the National Geographic. I don't know that they're necessarily always vile, but uh, <laughs> they, 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 they could be possibly also thoughtful. Um, but I think there are opportunities for collaborations to occur with non-artists. And so to bring them into your, you know, sort of uh, aesthetic imaginary as partners, right? you're partnering with people who may not be from that same profession, who may then allow you to see this as a kind of uh, collaborative project. Mm -hmm. So I mean, all with any of those videos that you know I didn't get into, these are all Surekha's videos. They're all about uh, individuals whom she's. Um, capturing the lives of the stories of who she feels like have been somehow <coughs> marginalized in, in the community. Just taking off from what Munas was saying, have the people, like, you know, Surika bought those keyboards from maybe some, you know, person who was collecting all these keyboards. Has there been any, I mean, what has the response been from their perspective were they invited to view the exhibit? Did they see the tracks that they had collected, you know, sort of in a different way? They didn't make them feel better. I mean, what was that sort of uh, interaction like, if there was any? I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure, but uh, of course, the farmer she's worked with mm -hmm. would see it. But no. she did collect these from um, an e-waste store in Vartur, so she goes into it. I'm not really sure that they came back to see the exhibition. Um, so I'm not sure how long, but it's a good question because it's, you know, you're sort of thinking about what is the responsibility of the artist to these communities that they're thinking of. No, also about. how it makes the person who collected this, I mean, does it give a different meaning to their whole act of collecting and what objects they're collecting? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I just had a couple of comments, actually. I mean, I was thinking about this notion of, you know, the, the found object and the ready-made, and a lot of the work that was being made um, around um, um, that was, was about a, a kind of institutional critique. It was, you know, taking something from the outside world and putting it in the gallery which also, you know, stretched the definition of what could be an art object, but also was a critique of the gallery itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you know, how are these works doing that? Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, thinking about Panita's question, mm -hmm. you know, how, like, are there, are there the people who are involved in collecting or planting the seeds? Um, you know, what, what is their real involvement? Um, and I think, you know, as an artist, um, who, who works in these ways, I mean, I, all, I know that, you know, those dynamics shift and mm -hmm. change and for, for a number of reasons. But then um, my other comment was about a work that I saw recently, um, which um, I think takes similar themes, but 
um, she um, uh, gets at them very differently, and that's Naiza Khan's new work in the Venice Biennale, where she's actually, um, um, there are a few, there are several screens uh, going on simultaneously, and there are meditations of pe on people making objects, and often with found material. So someone making binoculars, and so all you really see are, you know, the, you just see him sort of constructing this object, or a guy pushing his um, hela with, you know, these beautifully crafted uh, uh, boats and ships um, that are, are meant to sort of represent the, the, the ships and the, um, the port, the new port um, there. So. Um, you know, so, so what Naiza Khan is doing is really, she's just showing us, uh, a, 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 you know, something that we won't see, which would be a workshop of someone who's using the recycled mm -hmm. material or discarded material. Mm -hmm. um, and so that seems like a really interesting approach mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. yeah. 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 There is, uh, uh, in this exhibition itself, there's one artist, Suresh Kumar, who does a lot of performance art work. So he created a piece around composting as a kind of performance art piece. So that's interesting as well in terms of, you know, the sort of ongoing labor that you get to witness, not just depictions of it or imaginings of it, but being in the space of the laborer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so two questions. One is, I'm curious about what happens with an art piece like this. Does it get recycled or mm -hmm. does it get enshrined <laughs> as art and preserved in a different way? Um, and the other question is, I'm wondering um, if the folks who are collecting the trash, um, do they create art incidentally, which we don't, it's not in the gallery, it's not, is there like a vernacular of creating something that is not functional. I think the Jugard thing is, mm -hmm. is always functional. If it's not functional, is it art? Is it art and functional? So I'm wondering if you've um, encountered things like that or if any of the artists have encountered creative creation of art by the folks who are collecting it. That's great. Um, I, I'm not sure what happens to, be, uh, to these objects. I mean, of course, some get bought up by, you know, like Vivan Sundarans and all, you know, who, get bought up by galleries. I think Shiv Nagar owns the space that I just showed you. Um, but um, with Sureka's works, I'm not really sure what happens. What is its afterlife? I don't know that she kept them or you know, gave them away. Um, not entirely sure mm -hmm. of what happens to these objects. Um, sorry, and your second question? Oh, I was wondering if the folks who collect the trash yeah. The waste pickers themselves create any kind of art that you Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, again, um, unless you want to think of their work itself as a kind of you know, act of poesis, if not art, but a kind of making. But also, I mean, I've seen like floppy disks or LP, LPs made into artworks. So there is that vernacular. You mean like uh, exhibitions or. Or selling on the street. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. There is a whole vernacular culture of working with e-waste mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as as mm -hmm. art form and I will use the word art form because it is being used I mean this beautiful sculptures made by uh, artisans yeah. e-artisans I mean that's a new category we have to negotiate to create today but essentially working with floppy disks mm -hmm. and healthy players and mm -hmm. stuff like that and CDs, you, CDs and yeah you can make all of these things mm -hmm. so there is that whole economy charge keys little charge keys being yeah. created mm -hmm. right. and various things yeah so there's a whole new economy that's that's emerged out of right. e-waste that is mm -hmm. being in part of the vernacular domain in a way, which. And there was also a, a project in Dharavi uh, by the Dharavi uh, craft uh -huh. yeah. uh, and they actually produced uh, works and had a, an exhibition in Dharavi for Dharavi, um, and it appears that uh, many rat pickers from who lived in places other than Dharavi. I could have traveled like miles to mm -hmm. for this show. Was it electronic waste mm -hmm. or was it just? Ah, oh, it was all kinds of waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, uh, Pushpamala does some work with Dharavi as well. Some of her photographs are shot in Dharavi. <coughs> Again, kind of pointing to the 
sort of aesthetics of the pottery that's made in Kumbhavada and all these spaces. So you see these as kind of aesthetic spaces in addition to being, you know, just sort of looking at it as spaces of squalor. Uh, you speak of uh, this whole culture of obsolescence, where in this boundary between like the person and like the object, it almost uh, produces this person as the waste uh, and so on. Uh, in, in what sense is it? Is this in relation to the rack, to the rack picker, or like this whole thing around uh, automation and the IT industry, where you literally work? The, the, the work that you produce literally displaces you from the work itself in that sense. Yeah. That's great. No, I wasn't thinking about what you were just saying, but it's it's great, and I think it would work quite well. I was thinking mostly of the waste picker themselves and the way in which they get, uh, you know, sort of associated with waste in ways that um, entrench a particular kind of identity of the waste picker as waste, and so the way in which the work that they're doing further consolidates a notion of them as some human or you know, because of their associations with waste, uh, they get demoted in a certain way. And so how does this object make subjects rather than only thinking about the way in which subjects are making objects? So just sort of turning that around and thinking of how does something like waste or trash um, mediate social relations, right? How does it mediate between the person who's throwing the trash away or your you know, maybe your domestic worker <coughs> who's carrying the trash or is told to take the trash to the, you know, uh, wherever you could get something for it. So who is the go-between between the person <coughs> who's you know, getting rid of it and the maybe maid servant who's taking the trash to this incinerator or the seller, etc. So how do those social relations get uh, sort of put into play through something like trash, which is, a, you know, if you think of the way in which this non-human object or thing is in the process of consolidating a notion of who one is, I'm the one who may give that away, or, you know, I'm the one who accepts it or takes it. So how does that mediate our relationships with one another? But I actually really like your idea of the, about the electronic city, because I have another chapter on call centers, the one that Munis mentioned in the introduction, and I think it would work well in terms of thinking about the you know, the ways in which people are increasingly turning into automatons, right? They kind of, and some of the films I'm looking at, Ashim Ash, uh, Anubadi, I have the John and Jane film where he shows the increasingly mechanized ways in which the call center people are sort of working around the clock and turning into these kinds of automatons themselves. So there's that dimension to wasting away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manon, for your talk. I really appreciate how you examine trash as such a specific mode of analysis um, and aesthetic embodiment of the relationship between neoliberalism and subject formation. Um, so, and I also really appreciate how you keep posing this question of how waste allows us to understand who is deemed human. And it, um, it almost reminds me of, so my parents are from Bangladesh, and when I've gone, um, the people who collect trash in Bangladesh, they're literally regarded as um, moilar manush, and that literally translates to trash human, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't regard them as human whatsoever. And a lot of them also embody the valley caste themselves mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so regarding your piece, I was really specifically intrigued by your analysis of the urban frictions piece, where you've identified uh, these um, obsolete entities of the virtual waves, discarded technology, and the begging woman, um, and the, their lost use. And so my question specifically for that analysis is, what, uh, what purpose has the begging woman formally served for her now to become the status of begging woman? I think this is connected to a larger question of the relationship between neoliberalism, waste, uh, and the production of the category of subhuman, how uh, specifically how have waste pickers, those who now occupy the category of subhuman, how have they uh, produced the conditions possible for um, for modernization and development of Western and more affluent citizenship, um, and how is the aesthetics of this process more explicitly embodied? That's great. Uh, I think that you know there's there's a lot to be said in terms of the. Uh, 
uh, waste pickers and their identities and the way in which they themselves have mobilized and challenged some of these interventions and attempts to kind of formalize them, you know. So even as recently as a couple of months ago in Bangalore, you have um, an agitation that's going on with the um, waste pickers who are trying to um, resist attempts by the state to incorporate them within more privatized waste management systems. And, um, you know, first of all, the idea that formal economy would be better for them to be incorporated within rather than these informal waste practices suggests that these formal economies are not without their own kind of shady and corrupt systems, etc. So there's a lot of pushback and, you know, some of the activists, Clifton Rosario and others who are working with the uh, pool, pool karmikas are really agitating for uh, continuing to keep these in informal, you know, rather than sort of privatize and scientifize all the waste <coughs> management techniques. So um, there's a whole kind of interesting narrative about the pushback of these waste pickers as well. Um, and, you know, they're also engaged in these important projects of making sure that uh, the city and its sort of recycling is sustainable and that's something that one often neglects to pay attention to because we like to sort of think of very technocratic solutions to these problems of waste management, whereas we already have a very vital creative system of recycling that's in place in India that, um, you know, uh, affords a livelihood to many of these people and many of these attempts to formalize or privatize these will in fact make many of these uh, professions itself turn illegal or go underground. So there's a healthy amount of activism that's done by them. They've just written a letter to this uh, authorities who have been trying to do this work of privatizing them by pushing back and saying we want to retain our um, sort of informal networks. Um, so it's it's a good opportunity to see the ways in which waste pickers are in conversation with um, the NGO activists who've also been advocating for these kinds of practices. I don't know if I really answered your question. <coughs> questions I didn't have. So <laughs> 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 well, on that note, uh, may I thank you again thank for you. your fabulous uh, talk and really making us think about the question of waste. And I hope this is not waste, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you for a small <laughs> uh, token yes, of, of gratitude. Where is proudly Stanford? <laughs> 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 Uh, we have a small reception. I hope please join us and we can talk more yes. about questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.